Hi, my name is Valdemar, and in this video, we're taking a look at some basic concepts from electronics regarding signal strength and gain, and how these concepts are used in audio engineering. We're going to look at these following concepts, as well as check out some new online tools that we have on our website. There are way too many tangents and apps cases to cover them all, so at certain points in the video, you will see messages pop up like this one. Feel free to stop the video at that point and read it, but the information there isn't necessary to follow along with the rest of the video, so it's up to you just how deep down the rabbit hole you want to go. So, let's get started. We begin in the analog domain, where we normally define audio signals as a voltage. The current rarely plays a role, and in most scenarios, we can make it irrelevant by ensuring our outputs have low impedance and our inputs a high impedance. In simple terms, this means that our outputs can always supply plenty of current, and our inputs require a very small amount of current to work correctly. Therefore, the only thing that we really have to care about is the voltage. The simplest method of measuring amplitude is to measure the waveform's peak. This is the largest deviation from ground potential that the waveform achieves. Alternatively, we can measure it from peak to peak, the highest point to the lowest point. For a symmetric waveform, like a sine or a square wave, this is just two times the peak. So far, pretty simple. But the peak level of the waveform doesn't tell us much about its loudness. Consider these two waveforms. They have the same peak value, but clearly one will be louder than the other. That's because, in one case, the peak lasts a very short amount of time, and thus it carries less energy. Our electrical grid runs on AC power, where the voltage is a sine wave that cycles at either 50 or 60 Hz, depending on where you live. If you were to sample the voltage in your power socket, you would see it oscillate up and down. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low, sometimes it's positive and sometimes negative. If we connected one light bulb to an AC power supply and another to a DC power supply, and we wanted to make them both produce the same amount of power, making both light bulbs equally bright, how big should the AC voltage swing be in comparison to the constant DC voltage? The light bulb doesn't care which way the current flows or which way the voltage is polarized, so just for analysis sake, we can rectify the signal. We need to find the right level where, despite the AC wave sometimes being higher than the DC voltage and sometimes being lower than the DC voltage, Overall, they average the same amount of power. I will spare you the details, but to work this out, we calculate the root mean square of the waveform. And from that, we know what its peak amplitude should be. For a sine wave, this is approximately 1.414 or the square root of two. So despite the power in my house being 230 volts, the actual voltage is swinging between plus 325 volts and minus 325 volts. On average, this provides the same amount of power as a 230 volt DC power source. But what does all this have to do with audio though? Well, power and loudness are proportional. So if you need to measure how loud a sound is, not just its instantaneous peaks, RMS is a better measurement. But remember, RMS can only be measured over a period of time. For a repeating waveform, we can measure it over one cycle. For a non-repeating waveform, like an audio recording, we generally define some kind of look-back period from a few milliseconds to a few seconds, and we take the average power measurement from that period. We'll look into that in more detail when we start talking about LUFs. Our range of hearing is extremely wide, from the sound of a mosquito flapping its wings to the sound of an artillery cannon being fired. There's a difference of about 10 million times the amount of pressure that our ears can detect. With such a wide range to cover, our ears are built in such a way that they don't perceive loudness in a linear fashion. Rather, our hearing is logarithmic. To make a simple example, 10 mosquitoes might be perceived as twice as loud as one mosquito, 100 mosquitoes are perceived as three times louder than one mosquito, and 1,000 mosquitoes are perceived as four times louder than one mosquito. Because of this, it makes sense to measure signal loudness using a logarithmic scale as well. Enter the bell. One bell is defined as a tenfold increase in power. But like our hearing, this happens on a logarithmic scale. So two bells is 10 times 10, or 100 times increase in power. Three bells, a thousand times, and so on. For the freedom unit Americans out there who refuse to use SI units, the deci prefix simply means one ten. So a decibel is one tenth of a bell. One bell is 10 decibels. The decibel defines an increase in power, and for electric signals, power equals voltage times current. 
If we connect the signal to a linear load, such as a light bulb, a resistor, or a loudspeaker, increasing the voltage also increases the current. So, for a 10 decibel increase in power, we need to increase the voltage by roughly 3.162 times, since this causes a current increase of an equal 3.162 times. And so, the total power increase is 3.162 squared, which equals 10. But earlier we talked about how we normally define analog audio signals as a voltage signal only. So what if all we care about is the change in amplitude of the voltage component, not the change in power? Well, a tenfold increase in voltage would cause a hundredfold increase in power, equal to 20 decibels. We keep the same approach, and we simply remember that 10 dB is a factor difference of 10 in power gain, and a factor difference of the square root of 10 in voltage gain. 20 dB is a factor difference of 100 in power gain, and a factor difference of 10 in voltage gain. Simply put, 10 dB for 10 times the power, 20 dB for 10 times the voltage. Since we generally care about the voltage amplitude and not the power, this is the formula that we generally care more about when working with audio. Decibels always measure one value relative to another, this value versus that value. There are several established reference values that we should be aware of. The one that most people are probably familiar with is the reference for sound pressure level, which is 20 micropascals. And that is considered the smallest pressure difference that the average human ear can detect. You've probably seen charts like this one before, and from this we can learn that a whisper is about 30 decibels, or about 31 times the lowest limit of hearing. A vacuum cleaner is around 70 decibels, or about 7,000 times the lowest limit of hearing. And a gunshot is around 140 decibels, or 10 million times the lowest limit of hearing. It might be interesting to note that on Earth at sea level, the loudest sound possible is around 194 decibels, which equals atmospheric pressure. At 194 decibels, literally all the air molecules would be sucked away at the lowest point of the wave, leaving a complete vacuum. I'm not going to touch on acoustic waves any further in this video, that would probably require a whole nother video to cover adequately, but I wanted to point this out as it's the most common measurement that people think of when they hear the term decibel. What people are actually referring to is the decibel sound pressure level, or dBSPL. There are two reference values that we should be familiar with in the analog signal domain. DBU is a very common reference used to measure input sensitivity on professional audio equipment, audio interfaces, volume meters, and many other things. It's probably the most used reference value in audio engineering. It's defined as the signal amplitude necessary to drive one milliwatt of power into a 600 ohm load. Why one milliwatt, why 600 ohm? Because that's what they decided, so don't question it. Yes, it does seem kind of arbitrary, but it has its historical reasons. The standard transformers used on telephone lines and in a lot of early audio transmission equipment were 600 ohm, which is where the reference comes from. If we crunch the numbers, we find out that for a sine wave, this is 775 millivolt RMS, or about 1.095 volts peak. It's common for professional line level audio to be defined as plus 4 dBU or 1.74 volts peak. DBV is another commonly used reference, defined as 1 volt RMS, regardless of the impedance. It's common for consumer line-level audio to be defined as minus 10 dBV, or around 450 millivolts peak. One final unit to be aware of is the VU, or the volume unit. This is defined as plus 4 dBU, and is the signal amplitude needed to drive a standard VU meter to its zero-level marking. We've talked about how signals are measured in the analog domain, now let's turn our attention to digital. First, we need to briefly talk about how digital audio signals are represented. The most common way of doing this is using pulse code modulation, or PCM for short. The basic idea is that we sample the analog signal at consistent intervals, and at each instant we take the signal and convert it into a quantized value. The bit depth controls how many different levels the digitized value can have. An 8-bit converter can produce 256 different levels. We can either present this as a value ranging from 0 to 255, or we can bias the data between minus 128 and plus 127, with 0 being the midpoint. 
let's look at what the sample waveform might look like at different bit depths. Here is four bits. It has only 16 discrete values and we can clearly see the quantization that's happening. 8 bits has 256 values. We can still see some stair stepping, but it's getting less noticeable, at least from a visual inspection. 16 bits gives us 65,000 values. At this depth, we can no longer see the quantization visually. 24 bits gives us 16.7 million values to work with. So, many types of converters exist with varying bit depths, and it gets kind of hard working with all this data when the range of values vary so much. What if I want to mix together an 8-bit recording and a 24-bit recording? For this reason, when we're working with audio data in our DAW or a wave editor, it's common to convert the data into floating point format and normalize it into a range between plus and minus one. This makes sure all the data has the same range and the same bias. Now we can mix together data with different bit depths and we have a common data range that our plugins and software can use as input and output. Now if we have some common method of representing our data, let's turn our attention back to decibels. Our data has been normalized between plus and minus one and we will regard this as our definition of full scale. The actual calculation works the same way as it does in the analog domain, except instead of a voltage, we just have unitless arbitrary numbers. Like before, we can measure either peak amplitude or the RMS amplitude. Using peak values can be useful for gauging how close we are to clipping our signal, but it's not a great indicator of loudness. And just like before, we want to use RMS as a way to measure loudness. However, this is where some absolute psychopath at the AES decided to come up with the most confusing standard possible. In their infinite wisdom, the AES decided, as part of the AES 17 standard, to use the same signal level as the reference for DBFS when measuring peak values and RMS values, even though peak value and RMS are very different things. Remember, an analog sine wave with a 1 volt peak amplitude has an RMS amplitude of 707 millivolts. In the digital domain, according to AES 17, a signal with a 1.0 peak equals 0 dBFS peak, but it should also equal 0 dBFS RMS. What the In my not so humble opinion, it should clearly be minus 3 dB, but I'm not the one who created the standard. That actually means that a square wave with a peak amplitude of one actually measures as plus three dBFS. Yes, you heard that right. It's three decibels louder than the full scale, but it still doesn't clip. That is very counterintuitive, if you ask me. Okay, technically it is totally fine to define dBFS peak and dBFS RMS in different ways, but my God, is this unnecessarily confusing. Finally, let's take a quick look at LUFs. Using DBFS RMS as our tool for measuring loudness, we might want to answer a question such as, what is the average loudness of this song? Or, what is the loudness over the last few seconds? LUFs basically takes the RMS calculation, throws in a few extra tricks, and attempts to answer these questions. First, it applies a K-weighting, which is a simple way to approximate the sensitivity of human hearing by adding a high shelf boost at 2 kHz and a low frequency roll-off at 100 Hz. Second, a gate is added so that any signal below the gate's threshold is not counted towards the overall loudness level. This way, very quiet or completely silent sections of a song or a TV show do not affect the overall loudness measurement of the rest of the song or show. Finally, lookback periods were standardized. Remember that RMS can only be computed over time. For a repeating waveform, we need to measure at least one full cycle to establish the correct value. And for continuously changing signals, we determine a lookback period to calculate over. We have momentary LUFs, which measures RMS amplitude over the last 400 milliseconds. We have short-term LUFs, which takes the average momentary LUFs over the last three seconds. And finally, integrated LUFs, which averages the short-term LUFs over the full length of a piece of media being measured. 
There was this pissing match between the ITU and the EBU about LKFS and LUFS, gate versus no gate, but you don't have to worry about that anymore. They set aside their differences and now LUFS is the one true standard. At the end of the day, a loudness unit equals one decibel, measuring RMS signal level, weighted and gated, and averaged over a certain period of time. If all this math hurts your brain, don't worry. We've added some helpful tools to our website, which lets you easily convert decibels to gain ratios and convert between signal levels depending on which unit you need. To find it, go to our website at ghostnoteaudio.uk and from the main menu, click on Utilities. The decibel converter will convert between gain ratios and decibels for both amplitude and power. And for audio work, the amplitude conversion is the one you want to use. The signal level converter will convert between all the most common analog measurement units. Go from peak amplitude to peak to peak, root mean square or dBU and dBV. I hope this has been helpful and maybe you learned something new. I had to skip a fair amount of details, so if you have any questions or if you'd like to see me cover other topics in more detail, please leave us a comment below. Thanks for watching. See you again next time for another exciting math filled rant.